So how much velocity does your bullet lose if you decrease your rifle barrel length? We hope to find out on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We heard from patron David, who asked about barrel length and velocities. Specifically, this was his question. This is kind of an academic question, which may not have an answer, and it isn't terribly useful. I was thinking about it after you mentioned on a podcast that you gain, I think, 35 feet per second per inch of barrel length. What would be the maximum length where this would be true? I assume at some point you run into diminishing returns. You gain feet per second up to, say, 200 inches, but at 201, you start to lose feet per second? Thanks a lot for all you do. I appreciate your highly informative work. Well, thanks so much for that fine compliment, David, and a great question. And uh, especially thanks for uh, supporting us through Patreon. We really appreciate that. So if anyone of you would like to help us out and join our Patreon community, just go to patreon.com, Ron Spomer Outdoors, and all the instructions are there for you to join us. We'd sure love to have you. Now, to answer David's question, I wrote him back and I said, well, as you might imagine, David, there's no absolute answer due to the differences in the cartridge, the bullets, the barrel diameters, etc. But in general, the distance your barrel can be stretched is much longer than you might think. Some extreme range shooters have tested barrels around 40 inches long and they were gaining, still gaining, muzzle velocity at that length, 40 inches of barrel. So I don't know which cartridge they were using. Now I have read that the 22 long rifle pretty much optimized in 16 and a half inches of barrel. After that, the friction on the barrel, uh, the bullet in the barrel, starts to degrade its velocity, as you suggested with your 200 to 201 inch barrel. But with center fires and big powder. Uh, volumes behind that bullet who knows but you can easily go 38 40 inches and still be picking up velocity with some of those but it really doesn't much matter um, because who's going to drag one of those barrels around it is an academic question um, as you said so I think for practical reasons in the field especially for hunting rifles uh, the reason that most of them are at somewhere between 22 and 26 inches is just that they're too cumbersome after that to really be effective in the field. You don't want to drag them around. They're hard to get in, in and out of a scabbard, in and out of a vehicle. And they're even hard to carry around in the woods. Uh, the barrel sticks up if you've got it slung on your shoulder and hits branches. And I've even been in rocky cliff country when the r rifle barrel was literally hitting the edges of the cliff I was walking along and could potentially knock your balance you could go over the edge it's seriously <laughs> not a lot of people hunt in those places but sheep and mountain goat hunters and ibex hunters certainly do so yeah you're you're looking at oh i think it's it's worth your while to consider with a magnum cartridge especially adding a couple of inches of barrel if you really want to maximize your velocity but do keep in mind that you're probably only going to gain oh 100 feet per second with a couple of inches of barrel at most and does that really matter all that much to you you know it might but um it's something to consider but i don't think too many of you are going to be <laughs> carrying a 40 inch barrel in the field <laughs> the daniel boone days are kind of behind us all right thanks for that david this one is asking me if this is from richard another patron oh he's got a lot to say about the 300 wind mag he loves the performance of it. I started hand loading for three decades ago. Um, your videos about the 300 PRC have sparked my interest in that cartridge for a couple of reasons. The main one is the ability to seat the bullet without seating it too far down into the neck. The other reason is a point you raised about monolithic projectiles and their length in relation to more conventional lead core bullets. In the last few years, I've had trouble finding my favorite lead core bullets. Um, I've been able to purchase monolithic bullets with the same weight equivalents. So it looks like this is becoming more of a norm. I haven't really tested the monolithic rounds to any great extent in the 300 Win Mag, but the case capacity is diminished slightly, and I feel that that might be compressing some of my loads due to the longer length of the bullets. So I worry about overpressuring the rounds and possibly having diminished accuracy due to the slower twist rate, 1 in 10 versus 1 in 8 or 1 in 8.5, that you get in a 300 PRC. 
Unfortunately, I haven't tested this theory yet at any great length. With that said, are my concerns about monolithic projectiles valid when it comes to loading the 300 win mag? And he goes on with some more details. But that's about the base of the question. So, Rich, if you are not targeting game beyond 500 yards, perhaps 600 yards at the most, you really won't gain much from a 300 PRC, in my estimation. As for shooting those monolithic copper bullets in your 300 Win Mag, you really don't need to match weights of the lead core bullets for similar or better terminal performance. I have found that 165 grain Barnes TTSX penetrates as well as or slightly better than most 180 grain bonded lead core bullets. So perhaps not the Swift A-frame because that one is really hard and a deep, deep penetrator. But the short answer is if you want traditional 200 grain lead bullet performance with a copper, that will stabilize in your factory twist barrel, most likely a 1 in 10 inch. Uh, try the 180 or even 165 grain copper bullets. Last year in Mozambique, the, we shot a 270 grain hammer hunter bullet in my 375 H&H and I got better results than I ever have gotten with more traditional lead core 300 grain bullets in the 375 H&H. So yes, your copper bullets could be too long and they will not stabilize in the 10 inch twist if they get too long. Always think of length on these guys. We've always been taught the heavier bullets don't stabilize. It's not the weight. It's the length. I wish manufacturers would start labeling their ammunition with the length of the bullet and how that pertains to twist rates. Most of the bullet manufacturers will put on their boxes of bullets, will not stabilize in any twist slower than one in eight or nine or whatever it is. So it would be nice if they would do that on factory loaded ammunition too. And that helps us figure things out with the new calculators and things these days. Okay, so those were our patrons. Now let's see what folks have sent in to the team who compile things for me on the handy-dandy little computer here. We get it fired up, and we find out that someone in Colorado named Jason is asking something. Ron, I was just watching GNA TV. I assume that's Guns and Ammo TV. And they stated that one of the problems with seating long bullets deeply in deeply enough uh, is that they extend past the neck and down into the powder space and that the bullet then is pushed off axis when the powder ignites. They actually said that the bullet can be bent. I just don't buy that. As pressure builds, it will equalize throughout the case and the situation described would re require higher pressure on one side of the case than the other, which sounds impossible to me. I think you're right there. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever addressed this before. It seems like a cool topic. See if you can set the record straight. Well, appreciate that, Jason, and I appreciate your faith in me, but I think you've got it figured out. You know, the pr pressure within any vessel is equal in all directions. I don't see how it could bend a bullet. That's Even if you got pressure on one side only, the bullet would easily exit before it would bend. And in the neck of the case in the chamber, there's only about a ten, one ten thousandths of an inch space between the the neck of the cartridge and the wall of the throat in the chamber. So how how much how could it bend? How much could it possibly bend? Yeah, this I don't get it. I don't know if you if you misinterpreted it or if they just said it wrong or what. But yeah, this just sounds highly unlikely. Um, I can't see that happening. Now, something that can happen when you're hand loading cases is you build up a little ring or a, they call it a donut of uh, excess brass in the neck at the shoulder neck junction where the shoulder slopes up into the neck. You can uh, flow that brass as it heats and pressurizes and it pushes forward. You build up a little ring internally so you really can't see it. That can increase your pressure. So as you seat your bullet into that ring, it's going to be tighter than the rest of the neck. So guys have to get inside and ream that out. You need to kind of understand that. And that's after several hand loads. I don't know if a lot of guys don't they're pretty much used that case up and they toss it before they ever build up that donut. But it can happen with really long bullets getting pushed pretty far down in. Once they go past that shoulder neck junction, you have to worry about that. All right. This is uh, Corey from Montana. Greetings. Greetings to you, Corey. I am receiving an offer for a gun from someone claiming to be with Ron Spomer Outdoors. Well, imagine that. Is this 
a legitimate offer. <laughs> it's a legitimate offer for the guy making it because he is going to take your money and run. <laughs> No, Corey, unfortunately, this is another scammer. I don't even know if these are human scammers. I, I think it's some kind of a computerized program that invents new names every day because everything I put out is followed by some scammer saying to whoever sends in a comment, wow, we've got something great to send you or you've won a prize. And if you make contact with these people, I'm sure the scam is they're going to say, oh, wonderful, we're going to send you your new $20,000 rifle. <laughs> well, just send us $200 for shipping and handling. Somehow they're going to try to get your money. Don't play the game. We are not offering any firearms. We're not selling any firearms. We don't sell any ammunition. We're not even selling boots and underwear. <laughs> Someday we might do the boots and underwear, though, but I will let you know and you'll have it for sure. <clears throat> we might even get a hat to sell you someday. But yeah, most of those, I mean, all of those are scams right now. We are not giving any way, no contests. Sorry, guys. I'd love to give you all a new $20,000 side by side, <laughs> but it's not going to happen. All right. From Wisconsin, we have Rick who's asking, when reloading once fired brass, is it necessary to full length size when shooting out of the same rifle? Thanks. I enjoy your videos and there's much to learn from them. Well, thank you, Rick. <clears throat> yes, good point. This is kind of a standard for hand loaders. One of the reasons you can make such effective ammunition so accurate and precise with hand loads is that you can custom tailor the size of the brass to fit your chamber. As I think most of us know, <clears throat> there are factory specs on dimensions of your cartridge as well as the chamber. So the manufacturers have to build the chambers in their rifles and their throats and the leads and everything else to meet the standards, but they have tolerances so they can be a little bit looser in some, a little bit tighter in others. Same goes for the cartridge itself. They can be a little bit undersized, a little bit oversized. So you take an undersized cartridge and match it up to an oversized chamber, and you've got a fairly loose fit, and that can compromise to a small degree accuracy. Once you've fired that case, the brass expands to fill. It shrinks back down a little bit very, very quickly so that you can extract. And then when you resize it, your reloading die should match up to the factory specs for your, uh, well, for the SAMI specs for your chamber size. And you full length resize it means you just squeeze everything back down to those specifications. And now you're back to having a lot of expansion in that loose chamber again. But if you fire the round in your chamber and then you only partially size it, you can maintain most of the dimensions of that cartridge to match up to your chamber. And then in subsequent firings, you get minimal stretching and working of your brass. So it does two things for you. It allows you to have more accuracy because of that precision fit and longer case life. And the way to do it, I don't have time to really accurately explain it here. It should be in the literature that comes with your dies. It usually says full length sizing or partial sizing or neck sizing, three different options. And you can even buy specialty dies that have minimal case dimension sizes for a particular rifle. Some of that, just one of the fun things you get to do as a hand loader. Um, and it's just really enjoyable to know that you are being so specific that you're making a load that fits perfectly for your rifle, not necessarily anyone else's which is one of the reasons we'd say never to shoot someone else's hand loads in your rifle. Yeah, they're probably tailored for that rifle. You can full length size and fit all the rifles, but boy, if you start doing the, the fun custom work for your rifle in your chamber, then you don't want to be messing with that stuff. So yes, you're right on it there. Okay, now here is Harry from New Jersey. By golly, New Jersey. They always make fun of New Jersey. But I guess there's some hunters in New Jersey, and that's a good thing. Good day, Ron. Is there a comparison list available showing the correlation between regular calibers and their decimal equivalent? Ah, oh, I get what you're driving at here. So, for instance, the 5.56 millimeter cartridge is the same diameter as the 22 caliber, 0.224 bullets. So, yeah, I'm sure you can find lists if you go online and just search for that. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, 17 caliber, I don't know what that is in, in uh, millimeters. I've never heard of a 17 mentioned. I'm sure somebody out there has it on the tip of his or her tongue, but I've never heard that one. Uh, 20 caliber is a 5 millimeter. There used to be a 5 millimeter Remington rimfire cartridge. That was pretty cool. 
So there's your 20, and then the uh, 556 five, for 22, 23, there really aren't any, 24 would be the 243, the six millimeter range, so that's six millimeters. Then there's the 6.5, which is the 26 caliber, so we've skipped the 25. Never heard of one for the 25, but it's gotta be between six millimeters and 6.5s, so it's probably 6.3 or somewhere in that range. Then we go to 27, that's 6.8. I wouldn't have known that until the 6.8 Western and the 6.8 PR SPC cartridges came out. That's 27, like the 270. Then you go to the 7 millimeters, that's the 8.284, 28 caliber. 29 calibers, uh, 311, I don't know what that would be. Um, 30, 30 calibers, obviously 7.62. And then 32 calibers, I don't know. 8 millimeter is uh, point. 323 in the imperial system and now we're getting up into the realm where it gets a little hmm, confusing 10 millimeter is the same as 40 caliber 11 millimeter is hmm, 366 or maybe more and then 45 i don't know you're up there in 11 point something millimeters on those 338s that should be oh that wouldn't be in millimeters 8.6 yeah, so I'm going to lose it now, guys. <laughs> but you can find a list making all of those comparisons online, I'm sure. In fact, I think our friends at Backfire TV did that one time. You might want to search their channel. I think they compiled that list. You might find it there. All right, that was a good one. Bit of a stumper for me. Some of those are... Oh, and But while we're on that topic, guys, you do realize that these numbers don't equate specifically. For instance, the 284, the 7 millimeter, none of those numbers are actually right. 28 caliber isn't exactly 28, and it's not 7 uh, millimeter. It's 7.21 specifically, and I'm not remembering if that is the dimension of the bore or the bullet diameter, but those numbers just don't match up because folks round things off. You get to dragging those numbers out too far and it gets kind of complicated. So we just round them off. And then a lot of manufacturers will name cartridges just for the buzz, like the 223 Remington. It's not a 0.223 inch bullet or bore or anything else. It's a 224. But there are so many 224s out there and 222s. And so they just, hey, let's throw a three in there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it works like that in a lot of crazy ways. The 38 special handgun round is a 35 caliber, 357. Why did they call it a 38? They used the measurement of the outside of the brass at the neck, not the bullet. And it's weird stuff like that. Okay, now who else is asking us questions? Looks like somebody from New Zealand. We went from New Jersey to New Zealand. We went from Harry to John. John from New Zealand asks, hey, I've got a question. But first, I wish to say thanks for your interesting and informative YouTube videos. Very good indeed. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate that. Hey, a while back, you did a video on the wee little 6.5 Grendel, and you pointed out that it is a surprisingly effective round. And it's Medium game, effective, oh, I'm not really sure I recall exactly, but I think you recommend it to over 300-pound animals. All of this stuff about energy is a bit much for my simple brain, so what I want to know is killing power. That is, how good is it at getting the job done? Good question. I did some digging around, and to my surprise, I discovered, I think, that the Grendel had quite a bit more killing power than the heaviest good old 243 Winchester load. Is this really right? Is the Grendel better than a 243 at putting down medium sized game? And is the killing power score, or is the killing power score or the Hornady hits, that's H I T S, score, the full story anyway? Be interested in doing a video on it. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff there, John. But I've done some videos on killing power. I do a lot of them. I harp quite a bit about knockdown power because I think it's kind of a myth and it gets way oversold in the industry. <clears throat> so first of all, let's go back to your Grendel and 243. The little 6.5 Grendel, that thing is throwing probably 129 grain bullet about through 2,300 feet per second, maybe 2,350. 243 equivalent, you can't get that heavy, so we'll go with 100 grain, and that's usually 3,000 to 3,100 top end. So figure those two out. And then you've got the BCs of the bullet. Now, the, the uh, 
boy, you've got a two, 300 foot advantage. If the BCs of the bullet are close, and, and I think they would be, you're getting up into those uh, high fours, probably on both of those. So the weights are a little bit different. So that gives an advantage in energy to the 6.5 Grendel, but the lower velocity gives more advantage to the 243. And I'm thinking out at about 400 yards, you're going to be looking at 500 foot-pounds of retained energy in that 6.5 Grendel 129 grain bullet, 400 to 600 range, so we'll split the difference, say five. And it's about the same for a 243. If I remember my ballistic tables, 243 Winchester 100 grain bullet, 300 yards, you might still be hanging on to a thousand foot pounds, 400 yards. Eh, you still might have it 900 to a thousand. But then after that, I'm thinking the 243 is carrying more kinetic energy at those distances. But now you have to figure the momentum in the bullet because of its mass. And there's where the Grendel bullet could have a little bit of an advantage. So you might get a little more penetration, even though you're not landing with as much energy. And this is where all the complications come in, is how does this energy, the kinetic energy, that's energy in motion, how does that translate to actual terminal performance? Well, so much of it is dependent on the bullet, the constructions and the material, how it expands or and or doesn't expand. Um, and as far as knockdown power, neither one of those has enough power to knock anything down, but, you know, small little ground squirrel or something, you're not going to be knocking a deer over with either one of them. And that's really not the objective. And that's one of my gripes too, is that so many hunters insist on this macho knockout stuff. When you're really, your objective, what's happening is that you are creating hemorrhaging to the vital organs. And that's what takes the animal. That's why bow hunters are so successful with broadheads. It's not energy. You just need enough energy for the arrow to get there and that sharp broadhead to cut through to reach the vitals and preferably pass out the other side. Archers are always looking for the pass through because then they get good blood trail. Same thing works with bullets. It just doesn't seem that way because we feel the recoil and we hear the noise and we think, boy, there's just a lot of macho punch going on here. And that's what's taking them out, by golly. <laughs> but it's really just the hemorrhaging. The bullet has to get in there and damage the vital organs, cause the hemorrhaging, and then you've got them. So I wouldn't get too excited about it either way, John. I think those two are pretty darn close. And I don't know on this hits. That is interesting. The Hornady hits is a system by which Hornady ranks cartridges and the bullets that they're shooting based on bullet diameter, bullet mass, and the energy. And they think they do it, if I remember right, at 100 yards. What's going to be happening at 100 yards with, say, the 22, 250, or the 220 Swift versus the 243 versus the 270 and on up the scale? Each one of them will have their little category, and they're going to say, well, this one will put out a number, correlation of some kind, that correlates then to the size of the animal. And they group the animals into smaller animals would be, I think, under 500 pounds. 500 to 1,000 pounds would be medium size, 1,000 and up or something, elk, moose and all, and then dangerous game at 1,500 and up. And, they, and it's like that Winchester CX category thing. You'll see it on the boxes of Winchester animals. This is suitable for C2 class animals, and they'll have a picture of a deer on it, a white tail or something. And then they've got one, two, three, I think four different categories. Um, and others have created systems like this, including the Taylor knockout formula, which was actually designed to showcase how a bullet would knock out an elephant. So it really doesn't apply to chest shot game of any kind. But people want these this kind of information to get assurances that the bullet and the cartridge you're shooting is going to be effective. And I credit uh, Hornady and all the others who make these because they're trying to help us out by giving us a general idea of this cartridge is good for deer and maybe elk kind of falls in the middle there somewhere. Whereas this other one is way too small. The problem, of course, is that there are always exceptions. I mean, if I remember looking up the 243 on the Hornady Hits one time, and it it made it into the lower end of the deer-sized game category. Not really highly recommended as the ultimate for deer-sized game, and definitely didn't fall into the elk-sized game. Yet I had a friend once who had taken 13 bull elk with 13 shots from a 243. And they were big bull elk too. I think every one of them was a five by five or a six by six. 
So seemed to work pretty well that time. And then there are so many people who report that they get their most dramatic and effective kills with a 223 Remington or a 220 Swift. So it's not absolute, but it does give you a fair idea. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't depend on it to tell me that I have to use a certain cartridge and I absolutely can't use a different one. And then the bullet construction, of course, is going to change a lot of that too. But it's worth looking into. I would uh, suggest you get on the Hornady site and look up that HITS score, get on Winchester's and see what you can find out about their CX system. And even do some research on Taylor's knockout formula. A lot of guys will report on that too many of them, I'm afraid, not fully understanding that he developed that around the elephants that he was hunting. The bullet would knock out an elephant if he just missed the brain, didn't actually hit it. I would knock an elephant out and then it would recover after so many minutes. And he timed all that stuff. So he could say, okay, the 375 with a near miss, the elephant's going to get up in 30 seconds. And then the 416 Rigby, he'd get up in a minute and a half or whatever it was. So he developed his formula on that. And then guys try to apply it to shooting a moose in the chest. It just doesn't work that way. All right. That was a good one. Whew, I went on and on with that one, John. <laughs> Here from uh, Tennessee, let's talk to someone named Columbus. What bullets are legal what bullets are illegal to sell? Bullets that are illegal to sell. Spent uranium, plutonium, bullets dipped or painted with cyanide. I'm, I'm making this up, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. <laughs> no, that's probably going somewhere you weren't quite thinking of. You might be wondering which cartridges are illegal to sell rather than bullets. Because any bullet, metallic bullet, it's just a, a rock, a glorified rock. So you're selling a little tube of metal with a nice shape to it. And it's in various calibers to fit the cartridges. I don't know of anyone who can outlaw bullets. Probably someone in California. If anything, anybody outlawed them, that would be the place to find it. Um, I do know that California has outlawed the 500 BMG cartridge. You cannot buy a rifle and or the cartridges, I think, in California. Straighten me out here, guys. Those of you who know better, but there are a few jurisdictions that will try stuff like that. And then, of course, in other countries, there are um, proscriptions against owning certain rifles, certain cartridges, and that sort of thing. Um, several countries, I think, do not allow the 308 Winchester because it's a NATO cartridge and the 7.62 NATO, and they don't want these military rounds going to the guerrillas or whatever's going on with that stuff, terrorists and things. So there's some of that. But as far as good old North America, the US of A, if it's a commercial cartridge, you can buy it. Uh, I have I know of no restrictions other than some of these really, really big things like the 50 BMG in California. So I think you are meaning, rather than bullets, the entire cartridge. So uh, yeah, very few, if any. And, and <laughs> stay away from those plutonium bullets. <laughs> They'll make you glow where you don't want to. All right, from eastern South Dakota, my old home country is Chris asking, Ron, I'm wondering what your take is on a low-grain bullet, specifically a 58-grain bullet in 243 caliber for medium to long-range coyotes. What is the max range envelope for an ethical kill? All right, 58-grain, 243 bullet. I'm thinking of a Hornady bullet. They've got the 58-grain VMAX. I have loaded that in my 6-millimeter Remington as well as my 243. Had excellent luck with it. I only ever shot one deer with a 58 grain bullet and it wasn't that one. It was the factory load from Winchester of all things, um, hunting coyotes and had a great opportunity at a white tail. And I knew the bullet could do it if I put it in the right place and bingo, it did. So uh, on coyotes, I have gone to 400 yards easily with that. Uh, I'm thinking your energies are going to be down under a thousand. Uh, yeah, at 400, you're probably down into the 800 foot pounds maybe as low as six. I don't know exactly. I've forgotten what the BC is on that bullet, but that's what's going to hold you back. Your bullet's going really fast. You'll probably drive it at 3,800 feet per second for that 243. And that's a screamer. Man, it's going to shoot wonderfully flat. But once you get out there, it's because it's short and stumpy, it's going to lose because of its low BC. It'll lose velocity quickly and energy as well. So you want to be concerned about that. But I think you're good to 400 yards and probably even 500. Give it a try, Chris, and tell us what you think. And that looks like all the questions for today. 
if I'm not mistaken, nobody chewed me out for a mistake recently. Am I getting better or are you guys just getting lazy? <laughs> Well, I appreciate all of those questions, especially from our patrons. We do appreciate everything you do for us. Um, again, if you'd like to join us on Patreon, boy, we sure love to have you. Patreon.com, Ron Spomer Outdoors. Uh, you get early access to our videos. There's a newsletter. We let you know what's going on around here, kind of a behind the scenes with Ron Spomer Outdoors. And um, yeah, it just helps us keep the lights on and the... Uh, batteries juiced up. If you'd like to ask us a question, go to ronspomeroutdoors.com. That's our website. And on the menu bar across the top, you'll see, ask a question. <laughs> Click on that and a form will pop up and you can ask your question there. The team will get it and all the good ones will get sent to me for the reading and answering on our next podcast. So until next time, do remember to send in your comments and your corrections. Keep us on the straight and narrow here. In the meantime, enjoy your spring and hunt honest and shoot straight.